So this is Gina Houston conducting my first interview with Stan Kerr at the Hilton Hotel on November 11th, 1914. This interview, um, 2014. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> 2014, this interview is part of the Conversations to Create Unity oral history project conducted by the Susanna Dickinson Museum and Baylor University. Okay, first we just want us to talk about you. How old are you? Or what's your date of birth? September 30th, 1949. I will be 65 at the end of this month. And what's your family history? Um, my mother's people moved from Missouri to Iowa. Um, my father's people were Scottish and moved from, well, during the Civil War, they moved from Savannah, Tennessee to Southern Illinois. Uh, and so that branch of the family that did not remain in the Confederacy uh, settled in Southern Illinois around the Ohio River. And when did you talk about how you came to Texas and then to Austin? Okay. Um, I came to Austin uh, the summer of 70. I actually came to Texas when I was seven. My dad worked for Braniff Airlines in Des Moines, Iowa, and transferred down to Dallas. And so I lived around the Dallas area until I had uh, finished junior college. And at that point, uh, some of my friends uh, from Christian College of the Southwest were going to Abilene Christian College out in West Texas, so I moved out there, uh, stayed with them for about six months, and one of them graduated and was coming to the Presbyterian Seminary in Austin, so I said, Abilene sucks, Let's, I'll try Austin. <laughs> so I got here uh, summer of 70. I was also working at the uh, Abilene State School, so I transferred employment to the Austin State School. And there was a, a woman there uh, who was my supervisor, uh, Myrna Hill, and she enjoyed being my boss so much that she took up the position permanently <laughs> about a year later. So in May of uh, 1971, uh, we married and I moved in with she and her mother and daughter in East Austin off of uh, Springdale uh, near MLK, or well it was 19th then, but it's MLK now. And tell us a little bit about Miss Hill. Uh, she was a piece of work, uh, lovely lady, uh, very strong-willed, very opinionated, um, and she enjoyed being herself. <laughs> uh, she was a member of St. James Episcopal Church. I had no idea there were black Episcopalians. Um, and so uh, since our relationship was a little odd for Austin, she was black, I was white. Uh, the priest who married us didn't want to do it because the previous interracial couple, the Austin police, had run out of town after he married. Um, and so he was kind of hesitant to do the marriage. Uh, but my parents came down, uh, sort of tried to kidnap me the night before the wedding. Um, I declined to go with them. My poor mother-in-law, Ruby, had a dream that the Klan had uh, burned across my front yard that night. Uh, she and I had talked about uh, marrying Myrna. I had uh, walked in, she went to bed early, so she was in her bed uh, almost asleep, and I, uh, Myrna and I walked in, I said, uh, could I have your permission to marry your daughter? And she said, well, let me have my stroke tonight and talk to me in the morning. <laughs> At the time, I think there was only one other interracial couple in Austin. Uh, Lucius Warren, whose mother, Jewel Warren, had a uh, beauty shop down around 11th Street and uh, the freeway. Uh, he had played uh, professional football in Canada. He had a white wife, and uh, they were if not the only, there might have been one other interracial couple. 
but uh, Myrna and I uh, got used to being the subject of some interesting conversations and looks. So how, was, how long after you arrived in Austin was it that you and she married? Um, well, I got here uh, end of May of uh, 70. We worked together from that point on. My first date with her was uh, February of 71, and we married May 22nd of 71. And you all were married until her death? Yeah, she, we were married for 38 years. She passed May 11th, five years ago. So tell me, you said that you were part of some interesting conversations. Tell me something about interactions that you had because of your marriage to this. Um, well, um, one of the interesting things was that I ended up being the white member of her church. Um, and uh, I was uh, impressed, first of all, with the black work ethic. I mean, I was an old, well, I wasn't old at that time. I was a young hippie who uh, was not all that inclined to work, and it turned out that all these uh, black men I kept meeting had two, if not three, jobs. <laughs> and uh, that was the expected norm in the community I had joined, and so I ended up working two and three jobs. Um, we, uh, we would go out uh, shopping or to restaurants. I remember when our youngest, Tamar, was born, uh, we went to a restaurant uh, not too far from here, and uh, I noticed that Myrna suddenly covered the baby up with a blanket, and I looked at her and said, why'd you do that? She says, well, there are two white ladies sitting over at that table, and they're trying to see what this baby looks like, and I'm just being evil so they can't see her. <laughs> it's like, okay. And what year was that? That was 72. Uh, I had uh, uh, some interesting experiences. I ended up going to Houston Tillotson. Her uncle had been president of Sam Houston College, uh, which was one of the black colleges in Austin, uh, and they merged with Tillotson, became Houston Tillotson. So St. James had a lot of uh, folks there. It had been started out of Houston Tillotson by one of the faculty. And, Two or three other folks who were connected with HT were at St. James, including the financial aid director, Matthew Edwards. And he told me when I said I was thinking about going back to school, I'd had to drop out uh, of UT after Myrna and I got married because uh, I had to work to, to support uh, she and I and the kids. And so when, uh, oh, I've completely lost my train That's of thought. That's okay. Uh, where was I? I'm old I don't now. even know. I was listening to yeah. you. Keep going with what you're saying. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I've totally lost it. You're going to have to give me a clue. Your education. You dropped out of UT to go to Yeah, and then work. I went to Houston Tillotson. Um, Boots got me a financial aid package, um, and I became the white student at Houston Tillotson. And Boots was? Matthew Edwards. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I had the experience there. There was one other white student uh, ahead of me. Uh, well, there had been another guy before both of us, but that had been a while. But there was uh, John Ostertiki was uh, captain of the basketball team and he was the other white guy at Houston Tillotson. So I got confused for him a lot because uh, I was always in the gym playing ball. Um, and uh, when I graduated from Houston Tillotson, I got a United Negro College Fund scholarship, <laughs> which <laughs> some people found not just ironic, but offensive. Um, but since my wife's uncle had helped create the United Negro College Fund, I didn't feel too guilty about it. 
Um, so I graduated from HT and went to law school uh, here at UT. Um, at the time, I was kind of ticked off because they had declined to admit my wife's brother. Uh, and he was somewhat bitter because he had tried to get on the UT football team. Well, he was bitter because he had gone to Austin High, and as a black male, they wouldn't let him quarterback the football team. So he became a defensive back. So then when he tried to uh, go to UT and talk with Daryl Royal about being on their football team, they didn't have black folk on the team at that point. And so he ended up going to uh, Lamar, where he was an all-South Conference uh, defensive back. Then when he tried to get into UT Law School, they wouldn't let him in because he was black. And so he ended up going to Texas Southern, which Myrna's uncle had helped to get created. Uh, Carl Downs was not only president of uh, Sam Houston College, but he had also recruited him and Sweat to integrate the UT Law School. Um, Put this in a in a time frame for us. So this is seventy. Is uh, let's see. I went to law school, graduated HT in seventy five, and uh, went to law school that summer right after graduation. Okay. There was another. Uh, I say another black student, uh, I started having uh, an identity <laughs> shift uh, at that point. Um, and when they had refused to admit my wife's brother, I decided I would just explore how far this racial thing went at the UT Law School. And so I put down on some of the paperwork that I was a black student from a black college, just to see what kind of uh, reaction that provoked since I had the highest score on the law school admission test in this part of the country. And I found out what it meant. I got two letters <laughs> from schools interested because they thought I was black. That was it, two letters from the whole country. Um, so then, uh, I was informed by Harriet Murphy, my government teacher at Houston Tillotson, that the dean at the UT Law School wanted to meet me because he was confused about my identity. And so I went to talk to uh, Dean Gibson, Dean Fullerton, and assured them that uh, you know, I, was, I could be as white as they wanted or not, whatever they preferred. And so once they saw me, they let me in. Um, there was, uh, there were two other black uh, members in the law school, one of whom was Alan Page, and the reason he got in was because he had just been the most valuable player in the NFL, <laughs> so they let him in, except that he had a white wife and could not find a place to live in Austin. <laughs> so <laughs> he and I discussed that a time or two. Uh, because when Myrna and I were dating, I had been asked to leave uh, the place in North Austin that I was renting with some roommates uh, when they saw Myrna there. So I had ended up living in East Austin with Myrna. I'd gone to a black school. Uh, I went to a black church. I ended up at UT Law School. and. I, I knew a lot of international students from Houston Tillotson, so I asked Myrna, you know, do you want to travel the world and get paid for it? Because I can do a concentration in business law and, and we can get paid to travel around, do international contracts and that sort of thing. Her answer was that her mother lived in Austin, <laughs> so we weren't going anywhere. <laughs> um, so, um, I ended up doing UT Law, uh, and when I finished, I came back to Houston Tillotson to take Harriet Murphy's place on the faculty as the, oops. It's all right, it's not recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> as the head of the, uh, the government department there. So I came back to Houston Tillotson, taught for four years, uh, 
in the government department with Stan Murphy and had the experience, uh, you may be too young to remember a TV series named Roots. Alex Haley uh, did that. It was a big deal when it came out. And Myrna and I watched the first episode at home together, after which she looked at me and said, I don't want any white people in my house right now. You need to go somewhere. <laughs> because the uh, series had uh, evoked quite a response in her. And so I ended up going to the Houston Tillotson uh, Student Lounge to watch Roots with the other students there. Um, Heman Sweat was invited to uh, speak at UT. No one thought to invite him to Houston Tillotson, but he insisted on going. So I got to uh, sit down and have a conversation with uh, Heman Sweat there at the UT Student Lounge, and we talked about Carl Downs, Myrna's uncle, who was his hero. Um, and he told me about his experiences at the UT Law School. Um, one of which was still um, very alive in his memory, which was the time that um, he had been, the UT Law School had been forced to admit him by the US Supreme Court. So he sat behind a uh, partition that the school thoughtfully erected for him so that the other students wouldn't have to see him. But uh, there was a day when the Klan issued a death threat for him and set his car on fire outside uh, the school. And what he told me was that um, the students and a few of the faculty formed a circle around him and walked him home so that he wouldn't be shot. Um, I didn't have to go through anything like that. Um, and uh, the UT Law School eventually started admitting some black students. Uh, Gary Bledsoe was there, Darwin McKee. Um, in fact, uh, at one point, I forget which of them, I think Darwin was president of the student body for a while. But um, it ended up uh, being an experience. I still remember Professor Huey in the marital property class where uh, we were looking at one of the cases uh, that we were supposed to learn from, and it had to do with community property. And the case was that a woman had slaves, she married her husband, they divorced, whose property were the children of the slaves? <laughs> and I'm sitting there in 1976, 77, uh, at the UT Law School looking at this 90-year-old professor teaching uh, marital property from a slavery standpoint going, this is an interesting place. <laughs> Definitely a mindset here that uh, needs some adjustment. Um, my own family uh, tried very hard to talk me out of marrying Myrna, uh, but things got different when we had our first child uh, together tomorrow. And uh, once we had the baby, then my folks kind of came around. My sisters were always uh, pretty understanding uh, and accepting. Uh, my dad, not so much, but it, he, he eventually came around. Um, and now it, it reached the point where my mother actually liked Myrna more than she liked me. <laughs> um, I have, uh, Myrna and I had uh, two children. Uh, the daughter that she had, uh, well, we had a son who didn't, didn't make it, but then Tamara was born in 72. Um, Myla, the, the first daughter, uh, has two children. Uh, they're in high school now. Uh, Tamara had four children, and two of those have graduated from high school. Two are still in. Uh, so I had the six grandchildren who have grown up in East Austin. Um, 
had an interesting experience with the census back in 1980 or 90. I, I can't really remember which now. Uh, but on the census form, you had to declare your race. And so when the census worker came to talk to us at the house, I asked, well, how does the U.S. government define race? And they didn't really know. And so they called a supervisor who called their supervisor, who informed them that race is whatever your mother's race was. And that was the best definition that the U.S. government had at the time. Um, so we, the children and I, had uh, some fun with that on the census form, which turned out kind of weird because I ended up working for the census in 2000. And since I spoke a little bit of Spanish, they sent me down by the river and uh, I worked that area. Uh, it was real eye-opening. I understood uh, the extent to which the Hispanic population in America was undercounted. Uh, you'd walk up to a house and uh, be a lady there and say, okay, how many folks live here? Just me. Okay, just you. And I'd be filling out the paperwork and a pickup truck would pull up out front and guys with their lunch pails and work tools would pile out and file in past us, uh, six, eight of them. Uh, Sure looked like they lived there, so I asked her again, how many folks live in this house? Just me. So, okay, all right. <laughs> so when the U.S. government says, oh, there are 12 million folks here illegally, I said, well, let's double that. That's probably a conservative number. <laughs> um, I ended up working for the city uh, after I left Houston Tillotson as a faculty member. Got tired of having the electricity cut off every Christmas because Houston Tillotson couldn't pay much. Um, I uh, worked for the Human Relations Department investigating discrimination complaints. And so I got to see Austin's underbelly and uh, how folks were treated. Myrna had warned me that it was really bad that Austin had this liberal reputation that was totally undeserved in matters of race. And so I, uh, I had watched things like uh, there was a street person uh, down on 11th Rosewood somewhere uh, named Gil Couch that the police had sort of choked into unconsciousness till he died. Um, and then there was another black guy that they were arresting and they just sort of mashed his face into a waterbed until he suffocated. Um, and uh, Myrna had a, a friend who was homosexual and a cross-dresser and he was a clothing designer, Martin Sutton, and uh, he uh, did a fashion show one night. She had taught him to sew, and so he'd come by and, and she'd help him do his fashions. Um, and uh, he was uh, sitting, after a fashion show, he was sitting uh, up on uh, 11th Street uh, on, on a curb, uh, and somebody came by and shot him dead because they thought that uh, he was a uh, male prostitute that had cheated him out of uh, some money. Uh, it, Martin wasn't the guy, but uh, he ended up getting shot and killed just the same, and the police really didn't do much about that. Uh, I had represented Martin on a previous occasion when the police had harassed him on 11th Street for hooking uh, and uh, had charged him with the injury to a police officer because when they held him down and hit him in the mouth, the, his tooth had cut their knuckle. So they charged him. Uh, and give me a time frame on that? Uh, that was uh, mm. late 70s, early 80s. I, uh, my roommate uh, who had originally got me to Austin when he came to the Presbyterian uh, Seminary. Uh, he was at the seminary and Myrna and I were married. And uh, As a seminarian, he had done a ride along with the Austin police. 
And he told me the highlight of that night was when they pulled up to Ernie's Chicken Shack, two or three in the morning. And the cops were having a good time, so they pulled out the bullhorn and just went nigger, nigger, nigger at the uh, Chicken Shack. And they thought that was hilarious. And then they told him that they really liked the guy who owned Ernie's Chicken Shack because he took care of bad Negroes for them. And my friend says, what do you mean? He says, well, if there's somebody really bad, we tell him and he eliminates them. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, and they wanted a seminarian to know this for some reason. <laughs> So that was his uh, ride-along experience with the Austin police. Uh, I knew uh, the two uh, black Austin policemen who rose to captain, uh, Freddie Maxwell and Louis White. They both lived in the neighborhood and were friends of mine. Uh, Myrna worked elections uh, for 30 years, so I worked elections with her. Uh, Ida Best Jackson was our mentor there, uh, Claudia Allen and uh, some other folks, but Ida Best was a trip. Uh, she and her husband Lonnie had been friends of John Conley and his wife, and uh, as politically active black folk, they had uh, actually sat with uh, John Conley and his wife at a Democratic State uh, Convention, uh, so they were friends. Uh, I found out that there were a lot of folks like that in East Austin. There were all LBJ's people. Uh, there were black men who had worked with LBJ or Lady Bird who were almost part of the family. Uh, Gillis Jefferson, LBJ had set him up with the Palladium Club. Uh, there was a family that cooked for Lyndon Johnson and apparently uh, were the impetus for the Civil Rights Act of 65 because uh, they couldn't get to Washington to, uh, they couldn't find any place to stay when they drove from Texas to, to Washington or Washington to Texas and LBJ was upset about that. Uh, yeah, I, I just, uh, ran into a whole lot of uh, experiences and information that was really, really interesting. Um, I ended up, Myrna worked at Ward Memorial Methodist Church in South Austin for a while, uh, cooking for him, and the minister and I were talking, and it turned out that he knew Carl Downs, Myrna's uncle, real well, in fact, had uh, talked to him uh, right before Carl was killed about uh, what they were doing in the, the Methodist Church. It seems that uh, Carl had helped unite the Northern Methodists and the Southern Methodists. Uh, they had split during the Civil War over slavery, and it had never occurred to me, growing up in Dallas even, and being on the campus numerous times, as to why Southern Methodist University was Southern Methodist. Uh, it's because the Methodist Church had split into the northern and southern parts. And Carl Downs was one of the people who helped reunite the Methodist Church. Um, and my personal suspicion is that uh, Carl, having mentored uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, was probably the person who suggested Jackie to Branch Rickey at a United Methodist uh, Youth Conference that they both attended. Uh, I do know that uh, uh, Jackie Robinson has written that uh, Carl Downs was a major factor in, in changing his life. Uh, and Carl did the, the marriage for he and Rachel. Uh, and Bob uh, Downs, Carl's brother, had moved from Austin uh, to uh, New York to uh, manage Jackie's business affairs up there. Well, uh, Carl had done all this work integrating the Methodist Church. He had recruited him and Sweat to integrate the UT Law School. And there were people in Austin who were not at all happy about that. And Carl had some kidney issues. Uh, Jackie Robinson uh, 
was upset that Carl came back to Austin for surgery instead of staying in New York. And so Carl talked to the, the pastor at Ward Methodist Church uh, as he was walking across the street to go to Brackenridge Hospital for kidney surgery about what they were going to do at the next Methodist conference. And what I learned from black folk who worked at Brackenridge was that after Carl had his surgery, they just left him in the hallway uh, in the colored uh, waiting area until he caught pneumonia and died because he was a troublemaker. Um, and Jackie Robinson apparently wrote in, in his autobiography that he shared the opinion that Carl had been killed here in Austin. If he'd stayed in New York, he might have lived longer. Um, now, you were talking about the, the family of LBJ that helped, mm -hmm. that, you, that people said helped start the, the civil rights. Yeah. What, what was activism like in Austin around civil rights? Um, well, most of it happened before I got here. Um, I got here in the summer of 70, and as a, a hippie, I uh, was more interested in the anti-war activity. Uh, after I married Myrna, we uh, looked at what was going on in, in Austin, and when I was working for the Austin Human Relations uh, Department investigating discrimination complaints, what I learned was that what Myrna had told me was true. Myrna said that uh, in the old days, if you were a black man in Austin, there were three white men you went to talk to, and if any one of them said no, you couldn't get a job in Austin. And so you had to go somewhere else, California, Dallas, somewhere. She said that changed with Hancock Center because Sears came in. And suddenly you could get a job if you were a black person just because you were qualified to do the job. And she said Sears kind of broke up that monopoly that those three white men had, one of whom was Tom Miller, uh, the mayor. Um, and what I learned doing discrimination investigations was that uh, it was pretty bad here in Austin. Uh, there were certain jobs that were off limits. Uh, I had a real shock just last week. I was watching the 60s series uh, on TV and they were doing the assassination of President Kennedy in 63. And I noticed just looking at the room where everybody was when there would be a crowd of people, they were all white. <laughs> I mean, all white. You didn't see uh, anybody black unless they were doing man in the street interviews. Uh, the Oswald, Ruby, the police department, uh, the press, any crowd scene where there were people with jobs doing things is all white. And Austin was like that. Uh, and I, I watched the political evolution of Austin. And I watched the economic evolution of Austin. Um, Des describe those, the evolution of those. Well, uh, one of the things that caught Myrna and I's attention in the 70s, the first uh, real push for a subdivision in Round Rock was called Brushy Creek. And they were running newspaper, uh, television ads for Brushy Creek that in coded language, but in a very clear message was, y'all need to move to Round Rock, ain't no black folk up here. <laughs> and, you know, we're sitting watching the ads on TV going, good grief, they're just really being in your face with it, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, because we had watched school integration as well. Uh, I was driving a school bus when they closed Anderson High uh, and they uh, talked about closing Keeling, but uh, the black high school students had to leave their school and go to, to other schools, uh, the white schools, and integrate them. And I was driving the school bus and I looked very white 
And I can remember a black kid on the school bus so angry that they couldn't go to their school and had to go to this white school. I ended up having somebody throw a full can of Coke unopened at the back of my head. Uh, I saw stars. I mean, I'm driving the bus on the road and it's like whack. And I turned around and asked who did it after I stopped the bus and they all just laughed. So I did an old Bill Cosby routine on them. Um, if you're old enough to remember his first album or two, he has one uh, sequence where he's in school and uh, they're in shop and the shop teacher uh, has a, a wood or a wood burning stove in the middle of the shop and some kid throws bullets in the wood burning stove and after all the lead stops flying, the shop instructor wants to know who did that. Nobody will say. So Bill Cosby does this routine where he just says, the teacher just started talking about the kid's mama until the kid finally says, quit talking about my mama like that. Oh, you're the one who did it. So I used that Bill Cosby routine after I got hit in the back of the head with a Coke can. I was like, all right, and I just started reaming the guy's mama. And at some point in the back of the school bus, I, I see this kid nudge somebody and says, he talking about your mama like that. <laughs> and so I found out who hit me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed driving the school bus. Uh, I did that for quite a while. Uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was really sad to watch what happened with the old black high school. They paved the football field over, uh, and the building sat there empty for years, even though it was perfectly usable. But Austin did not want to bus black, uh, white kids into East Austin to keep that school open. So they found a solution. They, uh, when Austin uh, Community College was created, that became the campus. Um, and so then, uh, don't know if you remember, but Hollywood Henderson uh, got him to tear up the, the asphalt and redo the football field for the old Yellow Jackets. Um, I uh, Politically, uh, I watched uh, Wilhelmina Delco get on the school board, and then she ran for state representative. and. Uh, was elected there. I remember Gonzalo Barrientos, uh, his first race, he lost for state representative and, and then he won. Uh, but uh, Wilhelmina talked to me. Uh, I, I knew her from the neighborhood, but I knew her husband from Houston Tillotson. He was the academic dean there, Exalted Delco. And Wilhelmina said she had been invited to uh, join Northeast Austin Democrats. It was a, a white group that was trying to broaden their perspective. And she didn't want to do it, but she asked me if I would. And so I was a member of Northeast Austin Democrats for years, and at, at one point was uh, chairman. Um, I uh, had gotten involved uh, in politics when I was a student at Houston Tillotson, uh, Harriet Murphy had uh, gotten me a position working with the chairman of the Black Caucus in the legislature, uh, G.J. Uh, G. Sutton. And uh, so I had I'd gotten to know a lot of the black legislators uh, who uh, were the first ones there. One of my professors at Houston Tillotson, Gail Barkas, had met uh, Barbara Jordan when he was uh, at the University of Houston. He had originally come from Wisconsin, and he told me that his first experience with Texas politics was that the conservative coalition had gotten to the precinct convention first and had barricaded the doors, and the liberal uh, contingent was trying to break into the precinct convention. <laughs> Uh, but Barbara Jordan had traded her state Senate seat for a U.S. Uh, Congress district, uh, and there hadn't been any more black uh, 
state senators for a while. Uh, but then uh, we started getting some folks elected in uh, the 70s, and I got to know all them through uh, Harriet Murphy. Um, Do you feel like politics has changed at all? At all oh, yeah, it's that? not near as much fun as it used to be. <laughs> Uh, I know they, they did a retirement thing for Larry Jackson. We used to laugh about uh, his crew that would go tear down signs for candidates that uh, he wasn't supporting. Uh, but uh, my first real taste of how good Texas politics could get personally, uh, when I was a student in 74 at Houston Tillotson, uh, Harriet had gotten me a, a position with the uh, state convention as a credentials uh, person. So I had credentials for delegates to the Democratic State Convention that was held here in Austin in 74. And there was a Texas Ranger behind me with his gun. And I was like, what are you doing? He says, well, liberals and conservatives have issues in Texas. And if somebody tries to take the credentials from you, I'm here to stop them. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK, it's that serious. All right. Uh, so I watched the Democratic Party kind of open up. Uh, actually, they opened up to the point where the Republicans took over. Uh, one of the things I had learned at Houston Tillotson uh, from Lamar Curvin, my history teacher, was that uh, after the Civil War, the Republican Party uh, had black folk in Texas. And one of my heroes was Norris Wright Cuny, uh, who had been a major player on the national level out of Galveston as a black man. Um, uh, and so I, I loved learning about him. But um, when it came time for uh, Reconstruction to be over, the Republican Party split in half. Uh, there was the half that accepted black folk, and there was what became the dominant Republican Party, which was formally known as the Lily White Republicans. Um, and so uh, in Texas, as in most other southern, most other southern states, uh, beginning about 48, you had black folk trying to break into the Democratic Party uh, to get the ability to vote in primaries to help select the nominees who were going to be elected in southern states as Democrats. Uh, and of course, the lily white Republicans didn't want black folk either. Uh, so black folk began a process of busting into the Democratic Party and becoming accepted members of it. Uh, to the extent that uh, in the 1960 election between Nixon and Kennedy, uh, you know, Martin Luther King was a Republican. Uh, and what changed was when King got thrown in jail, Kennedy called to make sure he kept alive and, and knew that everybody down there knew that, you know, major politicians, including the candidate for president, were interested in his welfare, uh, which helped keep him alive. And Nixon didn't. And so from that point, a whole lot of black folks switched to the Democratic Party. Uh, then you had the Fannie Lou Hamer thing with the 64 convention, where LBJ and Mondale uh, kept black folk from the South from taking over delegations that they'd been kept out of illegally. But uh, after 68 and the Chicago riot and all that good stuff, then you started seeing more and more black folk involved, more and more elected. Uh, and it got to the point in Texas where we had a whole crop of black legislators. Uh, we had our first black member of the Austin City Council, Burl Hancock, uh, who was uh, yeah, they didn't want to have districts, uh, so they they created the gentleman's agreement where we'll elect a black person uh, to keep from having single-member districts. Um, 
And after Burl Hancock, it was Jimmy Snell. And after Jimmy Snell, it was Charles Erty. Um, and Charles, of course, was a, a friend of mine from Houston Tillotson. He'd been a professor there. Um, and so I watched that political evolution go on, took part. I was, Myrna and I were delegates to state conventions, uh, always went to the county conventions. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was precinct chairman uh, at Sim School uh, in East Austin off 12th Street uh, when Jesse Jackson ran in 84. And that was so much fun. The electricity was just incredible. People we begged for years to come out and vote were showing up in droves. Um, we'd had the Bill Clement experience where he'd been elected governor and everybody had kind of puked on that. Um, and when Jesse Jackson ran, I was the precinct chair. I, I took over the precinct convention, and I didn't really follow the rules. I just looked at this packed room, said, is there anybody here who does not want to be a Jesse Jackson delegate? And three or four people out of the 120 went off to a corner because <laughs> I, could, I could sense what the feeling was. And uh, one of the people who went over in the corner was Winnie Gage because she was a Walter Mondale person. Uh, and so we, uh, I said, you know, if, if you guys want to caucus over there, that's cool, but I can tell you right now, you're not going to have enough numbers to elect <laughs> any delegates. So if you want to just join the Jackson folk, you're welcome. Or if you want to be your own person, you can. And that was an outgrowth from my experience when Myrna and I were Shirley Chisholm delegates in 72 and we were at the county convention, and it became obvious that there weren't enough Shirley Chisholm delegates to elect anybody, and so we coalesced with the McGovern people. Uh, so I was giving folks a chance to do that if they wanted, because it had been done for me, uh, and that it enabled me to go to the, uh, the state convention as a McGovern person. So, um, we ended up with all these Jackson delegates. The county convention was so much fun because black folk had always been underrepresented and now suddenly they were overrepresented and we sort of took over the whole thing and swung it all for Jackson. Um, although the way we did that was a little underhanded. Uh, in our Travis County delegation, uh, we were kind of split evenly, and when it was time to take the vote as to which way we would go, uh, I had done a head count, and we were a vote short of having a majority. So I went to one of the Mondale people and asked if he could go get me a couple of Cokes, and while he was gone, we held the vote. <laughs> and so our delegation went for Jackson. Um, but. At the state convention, uh, Winnie Gage came up to me and she says, I'm going to be a Jackson delegate to the national convention. You're not going to rat me out that I was a Mondale person, right? And I was like, no, you're fine. Cool. <laughs> you know, I'll support you. <laughs> I'll be quiet. <laughs> you mentioned the gentleman's agreement. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the current 10-1 setup? that we're now going to go into and the fact that there's a possibility that there could be more than one black person on the Austin City Council. How do you think that's going to affect the fabric of Austin? Um, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, and I say that from a perspective of someone who used to sit with a map of Austin and take elected officials home addresses and plot them on the map and you could draw this little pie-shaped wedge in West Austin where 98 percent of all the elected people were from. And as someone who has wished, prayed for decades that we would actually elect district judges from districts instead of countywide because what you're going to see is 
the way it's been in Austin, you had to go to the big money people to get on TV to get elected. Because running citywide, countywide, you had to have money, you had to do TV. You had to have a support from the big wigs who choose everybody. Um, and so city council is going to be, I think, totally different because you're going to have people from neighborhoods who actually have concerns that aren't the concerns of the big banks, the big insurance companies, the big money people. Uh, it's going to be neighborhood driven as opposed to who can get the most contributions from the big, big pockets. Um, and so however the elections turn out, and of course you and I know how we want them to turn out, uh, it's going to be different, radically different. And I just hope and pray that it will also be for county judges, district judges. Uh, I mean, it would be beautiful to see East Austin be able to elect judges as opposed to having the folks out west elect everybody. Because you'd get a whole different mindset and a whole different set of priorities. You mentioned earlier some of the, the incidents about with the police in Austin. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any changes in that improvement? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I had Louis White tell me stories that were unreal. But um, I, as a city judge, I've gotten to know lots of city policemen. And they're, they're, we got some really decent people working the streets now. Uh, now, of course, every year, somebody, young black male, gets shot <laughs> and killed. Uh, that's still an issue. But, um, you know, I, I have been really impressed uh, with the quality of some of the, most of the, the folks we have in the police and the sheriff's department. Of course, we now have a black sheriff. Um, and it's, it's really been a major change. Uh, you know, it, you're still going to have law enforcement attitudes uh, that are problematic. But on the whole, I think things have, have radically changed. In the police department? In the police department with the sheriff's office. I remember when T.O. Lang was the sheriff, uh, uh, it was real interesting. I mean, uh, but at the same time, Austin has grown. It used to be a small town where you knew almost everybody. Uh, and so it used to be that if you were uh, drunk, they'd take you home. Well, now if you're drunk, they arrest you and book you. <laughs> uh, and so it's, as we've gotten larger, I mean, the population of Austin has doubled, almost tripled since I got here in 1970. Uh, my wife, Myrna, was born here in, in uh, 1940, and she watched it go from this little three-horse town to a major metropolitan area. Um, it's got all kinds of urban problems. Uh, you know, traffic is terrible. Gentrification is a major issue now. Uh, you know, young white folks are buying up property all over East Austin. Lots of black families don't have wills, and so their property has just passed through the, the tax system, foreclosures into you know, white ownership, uh, and we've priced folks out so that now black folks are going to Round Rock, black folks are going to Pflugerville, black folks are going to Maynard, because uh, they can't afford places in Austin. If you're not from here, if your family doesn't have some property they've managed to hold on, it's going to be real hard for young black folk to get it. On the other hand, 
uh, Harriet Murphy uh, insisted that I join the Austin Black Lawyers Association when I finished law school. And there was just a handful. I mean, I, I could tell you who the first black lawyer was, how many there were up until a certain point, and then just kind of blew up to the point where, uh, you know, we got a black lawyer running for mayor now that's on city council. Um, but uh, there's, it's not just F J. Philip Crawford or, or Harriet Murphy. Uh, there's, there's literally dozens, maybe hundreds of, of black lawyers, black professionals, folks with high positions in, in government and business. Uh, so there's been major changes in this town. But, you know, it, it's still, does, in one sense, a three-horse town. <laughs> you said that uh, Myrna told you that Austin had some real problems with, with race, even though they mm -hmm. profess to be really liberal. Do you yeah. see that still going on, or do you think that that's something that's been resolved too? It's not going on at the same level. Uh, black folk actually come here from other places to work uh, as opposed to having to leave here to go find a, a job somewhere. Uh, but, I mean, it's certainly not as bad as it was when Jake Pickle's grandfather beat the head of the NAACP so bad that he died. Uh, and then the mayor called a, a meeting at a black church to warn the black community about outside agitators, and we're not going to tolerate that. Uh, we're not on that level anymore, the Mayor Wooldridge level. Um, but at the same time, um, we haven't had a black religious leader who has managed to overcome the limitations uh, of East Austin. We haven't had a black political leader who's been able to overcome the limitations of East Austin. Um, and we certainly have not had black ac economic activity that has been able to reproduce what used to exist on 6th Street or back in you know, the heyday of black businesses. Uh, so in one sense, things are, are much better and different, but on the other hand, they aren't that different. Uh, it's, it's still, when you get below the surface layers, poor black folk in this town don't have much of a chance. And I've watched different uh, activist type persons struggle with that. I mean, I, I, I knew Dorothy Turner and, and Velma Roberts. Uh, in fact, I was one of the last people to talk to Dorothy well, before she died. Um, and you can name a recreation center after somebody, but if you don't staff it or build it correctly, it's not much of a tribute. <laughs> or if you close the hours because there's no budget for that sort of thing. It's, uh, you know, we've got money to build a, a bicycle track at Circle C, but we don't have money to put a baseball team professionally in Montopolis. Uh, you know, it, it's so the white folk can, can have their Round Rock Express, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but, I am watching East Austin evaporate. Um, you know, it's it's turning into large homes owned by young white folks, uh, and I don't know what's going to happen to a whole generation of young black people going to inferior schools with uh, they come out with an inferior education and there's not going to be any place for them in Austin. I, I just don't know that anybody has the ability to, or the will to turn that around, or if it can be turned around in time.
because the uh, the heroes of the past, you know, Dr. Givens or you know, who used to carry around poll tax receipts in his pocket and hand them out to the right voters, uh, uh, who could have been on the city council, except that the city quickly changed the way they elect city council members, so he couldn't be. Uh, yeah, unless this 10-1 thing really turns things around, uh, if it can, uh, I just do not see a positive future for young black Austinites. Uh, they're going to be priced out of, out of town. You mentioned the uh, 6th Street and the heyday of black businesses. What was What is that about? Uh, there used to be all kinds of black businesses on Pecan Street. Uh, yeah, and, and there were black folk who had, oh, well, that's that's farther back in history. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, yeah, go to the Austin History Center, look that okay. one up. <laughs> what do you think, you've talked about some of the changes that you've seen, what do you think are the most critical changes, the most, the changes that have had the most impact? I think one of the things that's had the biggest impact has been the lack of interest in funding on a statewide level to uh, promote voter turnout in minority communities. Um, certainly the Republican majority that's running things doesn't want to do that and the Democratic Party has seemed to have given up on it uh, it's it's been amazing to me to watch the breakdown of the structure of the Democratic Party in Texas especially in in Austin um, black folk do not really turn out to vote in a block anymore uh, in a significant way. And part of that is, oddly enough, I think, due to uh, absentee extended voting. Uh, the, it used to be election day was a big deal, especially in the black community. And now with the uh, extended time period to vote, there's no concentrated get out the vote area uh, impetus uh, you just don't see it like it used to be. Uh, folks get in their cars and go collect people all day and carry them to the polls on election day and there'd be a line of people and they'd visit and have a sense of community and talk over things and you'd know most of the people in your precinct who voted, you knew all the precinct workers. Now it's yeah, you go anywhere in the city you want and cast your vote if you feel like it. Or as uh, I think Stephen Colbert said last week, uh, what is the uh, the day after election day? That's the day where everybody goes, oh, I meant to vote. <laughs> um, television has been a terrible influence because it used to be that it was hot and you'd go outside on your porch and you'd visit with neighbors who were either walking or sitting on their porch. Now everybody's inside the house or inside the car with the air conditioner going and the TV on. Uh, so between air conditioning and television, there's not much as a sense of community. You may not even know who your neighbors are. The only time you see them is when the garage door goes up or down and they drive off. Um, so Austin's losing that sense of community, plus segregation. You know, Tom Philpot unearthed that uh, city council meeting from about 36, where they decided we're gonna cram all the black folk into one part of town and eliminate all these spread out black communities. So Clarksville's not black anymore. You know. And so you had all these folks stuck in East Austin and then the banks wouldn't loan them money to fix up houses so the properties would deteriorate. The insurance companies wouldn't cover them so they couldn't get coverage. Uh, you had the redlining. Um, if you were black, they wouldn't show you a house outside of a certain area. If you were white, they wouldn't show you a house in East Austin. 
Well, now that's breaking up to the point where you don't have a cohesive, coherent black community. They took away the black schools. Um, although we're resegregating quickly <laughs> in that sense. But uh, East Austin, between uh, illegal folks who have settled in droves because it was cheaper housing, to black folk moving out or losing property through uh, foreclosures, you don't have the same numbers, you don't have the same groupings. You still have black churches, but even there you got like Grant Chapel moved from 12th Street out to Northwest Austin. Uh, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, but what used to be is not ever going to happen again. What's, is there anything else that you want to share with us about your experiences in Austin? Uh, in terms of interracial marriage, it has really become so common that it's not that uncommon anymore. Although I was talking to one of the folks who works at uh, St. David's Hospital this morning, black woman who has a white husband now, and she was talking about how she doesn't like the way people look at her. But uh, coming from a perspective of being one of the two or three black uh, interracial couples in Austin to seeing young folk everywhere uh, where it's not a big deal. Uh, and of course, uh, congruent with that is the, the outgrowth of the homosexual community, male and female. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch as our society has loosened up in some areas, but on the other hand, if you told me in 1970 that marijuana was still going to be illegal in 2014, I'd have thought you were high. <laughs> I'm still not understanding how that's happening unless the alcohol lobby really is that powerful or politicians are really getting that much money under the table. Um, but, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, the UT football team has gone from totally white to mostly black. But if you look at the cheerleaders, they're still almost all white. Uh, if you look at the number of students at UT, there are probably more Asian students at UT than black students, black American students, certainly Austin black American students. Um, Houston Tillotson, black colleges generally are under attack. Uh, don't know how long they're going to survive economically because the the impetus to do something to keep them alive keeps lessening. Um, it's there. There are a lot of things to be hopeful for, but there are a lot of things to mourn that just are not and won't be again. Uh, I remember one time. I guess it was late 70s, Myrna and I were sitting watching television and somebody black was being talked to on the news and she almost came off the couch. She's like, I don't even know them. <laughs> I said, well, do you know everybody black? And I said, yeah, and their mama. <laughs> and who, where they live. <laughs> and that's changed. Um, on the other hand, the, the dispersion uh, of population has also been the dispersion of uh, intensity of culture and it's also been a dispersion of political input. Um, I don't know that anybody goes to a major black political power and says what do you think we need to do about this. I think what's happening now is that they look and go black folk don't vote we don't care what they want. And what it's going to take to turn that around, I don't know. Because when Jesse Jackson ran in 84, it was electric. When he ran in 88, it was still electric. Now, when Obama ran in 08, it was a different experience. Um, 
he energized a whole different crowd of people. A lot of older black folk were Hillary Clinton supporters because that's what they knew. And it reminded me so much of the Mondale folk in 84. Um, my own wife, Myrna, uh, she was a Clinton supporter. I'm like, why are you supporting Hillary Clinton? She says, well, because if Obama wins, they'll kill him. Uh, now that changed as she realized how viable he was, then she became enthusiastic. Uh, but having had a black president and having seen how little impact positively that's had on economics for black folk, uh, I don't know if anybody else is going to generate the excitement. And Obama's excitement was not the same as it was in 84 and 88 with Jackson because he was energizing young white folk as well as black folk. Uh, and he really hasn't done much for black folk. Uh, so, I don't know. Be interesting to see what the future holds, although politically, uh, outside of Austin, looking at what's available, you kind of go, eh, not much hope there. <laughs> yeah. Or as Sarah Palin says, how's that hopey changey thing working out for you? Uh, but in Austin, we did finally get single member districts and we're going to see where that takes us. Hopefully the right people will get elected and, uh, and it'll make a real difference and folks will start addressing some of the underlying issues that have been strangling this town in a lot of ways for so long. And maybe my grandchildren will have a uh, much more hopeful experience than I'm afraid they're going to have.